I am Flavia Zinanen from the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Western Australia and today we have with us Don Vincent. Don Vincent is um, the Perth International Festival Program Manager and we are going to be discussing the role play by the Cannes Festival in international relations. Pleasure having you with us. Thank you Flavia, pleasure to be here. Um, Tom, can you please describe how the Cannes Festival has evolved from its 1939 um, first design to the impact that it has today to the cultural world? Sure, uh, I can try. Um, as you say, the Cannes Film Festival started, it was supposed to start in 1939, and it was conceived as a, a mechanism for um, it, stability within Europe whereby there would be a free and open competition for um, films um, and it was supposed to be a corrective to the Venice Film Festival because the Venice Film Festival um, was established by the fascist government in Italy uh, and was awarding prizes to films like Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, a Nazi propaganda uh, kind of cinema and the Cannes Film Festival um, was intended to be a, a, a festival of the free world. Um, the first edition was supposed to happen in September 1939 uh, and on the, the, the day prior to, to, to the, the first date of the Cannes Film Festival, Germany invaded Poland and the festival was cancelled. Uh, and it was on until, it took until 1946 for the Cannes Film Festival to actually start properly um, and, and show films. And, um, and according to that original ethos, um, it was a festival of the free world. Um, participating nations at Cannes would submit their films, so um, there was no central selection committee to the festival. Uh, each country would select its own films. So Australia would select films, Brazil, um, Britain, and they would uh, um, be, in, be in competition, be awarded a prize by French film critics. And uh, this situation continued until the late 60s, at which point the, the, uh, the festival of, of 1968 was uh, cancelled partway through because it was um, tied up in the, um, the student protests of 1968 in, in Paris. They, they uh, overflowed it to the Cannes Film Festival and the festival was shut down. And it was then renewed in the late 60s and early 70s. They abandoned the, the selection by country and had uh, established a, a central selection process. So um, um, a, a panel of critics under the director of the festival would go all over the world and find new films from, from, from all over the world uh, and these would be um, selected for competition and especially in this latter period, so after 1968 and after the early 70s, um, um, Cannes has maintained its position as, the, as the, the world's leading film festival, the highest profile film event in the world by some great distance probably one of the most mediated um, cultural events uh, in the world um, after the Olympics and the Soccer World Cup. And um, while uh, maintaining um, a particular relationship with um, Hollywood, glamour and power, it is also at the same time um, uh, positioned itself as a festival of, of discovery, uh, of discovering new kinds of cinema from regions in the world that um, were not, uh, the, the cinema of which was not well known. Uh, so it's kind of gone through different phases from um, you know, the, the immediate post-war era uh, to an increasing a stage of increasing um, professionalization. It's, it's, it's grown much bigger, it now has a huge market alongside it, which means that um, it's, it's very important to do business at Cannes. Uh, and while the, the, the official selection of the festival is giving a, um, 
a high profile to, as I say, new discoveries of new kinds of cinema. Um, there is also a process whereby um, films are, um, a production of films are discussed by official components of various various governments. So um, there's uh, there's what there's something called an international village of Cannes where nations from all over the world um, send uh, financiers and, and, and production divisions and um, find ways to to attract uh, money to their countries to make to make films. So it's there's a there's a lot of there's, there's um, different directions in which the, the money flows and in which the um, the cultural capital flows at can. Um, it's a it's a huge and complex event. Yeah. Mm, thank you very much, Tom. That's all right. And uh, can you please just expand a bit more the impact that the Cannes Festival has um, on um, international relations? And you are just um, scraping the surface of the economic component yeah. and um, how large and complex the organization of the event is in itself. So can you just expand that a little bit more? Um, yeah, well, the the economic component is um, manifests in a, in a huge trade fair. So um, alongside the official selections, there's an official competition at Cannes, and then there's a, there's something called Un Certain Regard, which is um, for less commercial films and there are also another three um, competition strands that are that are not officially part of the festival but are along that happen at the same time and there are those official selections but then there is a vast um, free market of new films um, that uh, that screen in about 30 or 40 screening rooms constantly throughout the festival and um, there is um, uh, a, a trade Fair component with a lot of stalls where you can you can go and, uh, and meet and buy and sell films, um, and it's the biggest film market in the in the world. So it's 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 got this very kind of uh, prosaic uh, business like atmosphere where the majority of the activity is. So the majority of the of the delegates of the festival are are are, are doing this this kind of trading, um, buying and selling films. Um, and immediately outside of this, so this, this all happens, this trade fair stuff happens in the Palais du Festival. There's several thousand people. And immediately outside, there's the red carpet. So you have this very this kind of strange and interesting juxtaposition between uh, very, um, you know, everyday kind of business activity. And then you can step outside and see, um, you know, Charlie Theron or Woody Allen or somebody a few hundred, uh, you know, 50 meters away on the red carpet, and you suddenly understand that the um, the, the 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 glamorous component of, of Cannes, the one that is projected around the world, um, serves the market uh, very very well because it, you know it, it draws um, profile and attention to the market, and at the same time the the um, uh, the, the the market. Uh, reinforces everything that's going on on the red carpet because um, that's where the, the distribution um, of, of the films happens. And also, it's not just Charlie Theron and Woody Allen. You you could have those those um, kind of um, Hollywood stars in the afternoon, and then someone like um, you know the, the Thai filmmaker um, um, Apichat Bong Wirasethakul who's um, not a household name, makes very, very refined kind of art movies, and whose, um, whose work is a million miles removed from Hollywood, but, but, but can puts them on the same platform. So it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's kind of an egalitarian approach to, to film art, which actually is uh, quite unique because um, it, it gives each of, it gives Woody Allen and Weir Sithical the same kind of badge of honor. Yes, Cam selected you, therefore you are um, you are you are worth you are worthy, you're worthwhile. So there's all that and then um, and then as I say there's a, there's something called the International Village, which is where um, nations go to attract funding. So you can walk into say the Australian Pavilion or the British Pavilion and um, you can 
learn about um, Western, how you know what what happens if you if you take your film production to Western Australia. What kind of locations you might find. Um, what kind of tax breaks there are, what kind of co-productions you can, you can work up. There may be an arrangement between, um, you know, West Yorkshire, where I'm from, and uh, some studio in, in Romania, whereby they, 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 can share, um, they can share personnel. Uh, and for, um, for the countries that are represented at the International Pavilion, uh, this activity can be seen as an important part of their, um, you know, their, their foreign office or their um, their international relations activity. So, in the, in the British case, uh, the British Council uh, runs the the British Pavilion at Cannes. The British Council is is a part of the um, uh, a, a part of the British government that is to do with um, uh, cultural. Um, you know, Brit promoting British culture around the world, and it's seen as a, an important part of, of cultural diplomacy and soft power. Uh, and the the emphasis for that, of, of course, changes over time, um, and it changes according to region. So, um, um, but f British cinema is um, quite a, a strong cultural artifact within. Within British culture internationally, so um, there's always um, there's always you always feel even if the, even if British films haven't been selected for the main competition at Cannes, you always feel the British presence through um, the activities at the International Village and uh, and um, the, um, uh, the you know you, you sense that the British films are are, you know, are, are being being sold. Um, that that's definitely apparent, and there's, and there's a lot of effort that goes into that on behalf of the, on, on the part of the British Council. So um, yeah, and yeah, in that if, if you'd have to look at each, um, you'd have to look at several nations individually to see what kinds of um, uh, levels of activity they, they achieve at, at, at the International Village at Cannes. So I, I when I'm when I'm not seeing films at Cannes, I'll, I'll often wander through there and. You know, check out check out what the Philippine um, uh, um, office at the International Village is up to, or, or, or whatever. I'll look at you know, Switzerland one day, and you get very varying degrees of, of activity there. Sometimes it's just one person, um, you know, um, handing out a, some information on, on that year's films that were made there. Sometimes there's there's, act, there's there are meetings going on all over the place, and you're being invited to parties and. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it, 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 there's, a, there's a lot of variance there in, in, in activity, but it's, um, uh, it's the, the power of the festival is such that it's, it's, it's really um, the one shopping window for that nation's audiovisual culture throughout the year. Mm -hmm. mm. Fascinating, thank you so much. It's okay. And um, if you could please um, expand a little bit more and explain to us, um, how the Cannes uh, Film Festival uh, raises awareness to different ways of living mm -hmm. and might bring about greater acceptance of um, different cultures. Yes, okay. So, um, as I say, the, the Cannes Film Festival has um, been in this cycle now for quite some decades of, of discovering um, cinema uh, from different regions of the world. And by including films from those regions in competition and uh, supporting artists from those from those regions, um, it has um, meant that more of that kind of cinema gets into distribu more distribution internationally. So, early examples of this might have been in the in the mid 1970s when there are a lot of Polish films selected for competition at Cannes. Um, when uh, you know the uh, solidarity movement in in Poland was gaining ground, those filmmakers that had um, uh, a, a kind of left, well, a, 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 an independent kind of voice, um, were supported. And can in the 70s and 80s was positioned itself as, as supporting independent artists in repressive 
regimes. Um, another one would be the, the filmmaker from the Philippines, Lino Broca, who um, made uh, very interesting um, kind of melodramas and commercial cinema, but ones which were very critical of the, the Marcos government. Or um, uh, in the 80s, what was called the fifth generation of Chinese filmmakers, who um, again had um, uh, uh, an independent voice within uh, within China, and um, by including these these filmmakers in competition and sometimes uh, giving them prizes, that meant that those films would suddenly be seen all over the world. They would they would be in distribution all over the world, uh, and suddenly you know. Um, for me, growing up in, in West Yorkshire, in, in England, I would um, get a chance to see, um, let's say, Iranian films. And I had no um, concept of uh, what Iran was like beyond newspaper headlines, but suddenly you'd have these um, artistic-driven cultural artifacts which give a sense of what life might be like there, what, what people's everyday concerns are what the similarities and differences are between uh, Iranian people and, and myself. Um, and because cinema is all about experiencing the other, whether you know, it's someone in Iran or it's someone, you know, your, your next door neighbor, cinema is, is all about seeing, experiencing things through other people's perspective. Um, the, the mechanism that can has the Cannes Film Festival has to uh, give a platform to, um, you know, filmmakers from Iran, China, uh, Poland, whatever, uh, means that we start to build up a richer map of of the world, uh, and um, yeah, and it's something that the, the festival is quite conscious of. It, it, you know, the, the selectors know that if they can not just support, um, you know. It, w it wouldn't be a case of just finding a, a, a Chinese filmmaker in um, in the in the mid '80s and, and including them once. They'd want to maintain that presence from that filmmaker or, or a group of filmmakers that they are associated with over a long, long period. Um, and you can see cycles of that in in Cannes programming history. Um, so the, you know, the Romanian Romanian cinema is, um, has been a um, a presence at Cannes since uh, about 10 or 15 years, and an Ara um, a Romanian film won the top prize, the Palme d'Or, at, at Cannes uh, in 2007, I think it was. And you see every, every year there are, there are um, Romanian films uh, at Cannes, and um, they get grouped together as something called, you know, they call it New Romanian Cinema, it's always the new, the new wave. Uh, of wherever it's from, so it's a Romanian new wave, it's an Iranian new wave, it's a Taiwanese new wave. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's something that's, that's consciously cultivated by the Cannes Film Festival as a way of maintaining their, their, their profile of, of um, making discoveries. Um, and it has, I think, it, in, in terms of, as I say, in terms of our diet of cinema anywhere in the world, Cannes has a, a very important function in, um, uh, in in moving us on. It's not the only it's not the only um, operator in this way. Now there are many other film festivals, but Cannes is still the the mm. preeminent one. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, to uh, wrap up our interview, um, Tom, if you could please um, just explain to us. Um, the Cannes Film Festival and its role of raising awareness of the otherness and promoting cultural plurality in the world, mm. to which extent this could also mitigate international conflicts mm. and bring a little bit more of understanding to conflict zones around the world? Well, it can only ever do this in quite an indirect way. But um, to go back to the Iranian example, um, I do think that because of festivals like Cannes and also Venice and Berlin, that we um, internationally now have a, a richer, or the, there is a richer um, image of Iran available to us than there would have been in, let's say, um, 1992. And that is because 
uh, since the early 90s, Iranian cinema has been consistently um, supported at international film festivals. So that we now have many examples, if, if we are curious enough to, to, to um, find a you know, rich artistic expression and a, and a, and a, and a complex a, a complexity of understanding of, of what life in Iran is like. Um, and so last month an Iranian film won the, the, the Oscar for Best Foreign Language uh, Film. And it's the second time that an Iranian film has done that. And I don't think, I don't think that would have been possible if, if, if there hadn't been those, um, the, the presence of Iranian cinema hadn't been felt through, through film festivals for such a long time. We wouldn't have got to the point where uh, people had become used to um, anticipating and appreciating an Iranian film, Iranian cinema, so that it would eventually win the, um, the, the prize for uh, best foreign language film at the Oscar, Oscars. And um, all of this feeds into public debate about um, uh, uh, foreign policy. And, um, and I think it, it it must surely have some bearing on um, um, the, the ways in which governments around the world um, respond to um, areas of conflict. But you can't. I don't think you can be more specific th than that. I can't think of uh, you know a single example of, of a film that has prevented a conflict. I may be wrong. There may there may be there may be something, but you know. They they do change. Cinema does change perceptions, and it, 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 it does that over time. And for that to happen over time, you need you need strong um, cultural institutions, I think, to um, to uh, support complexity and, and plurality. Um, so yeah. So in the end of the day, movies they do have the soft power component, don't they? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, pleasure talking to you, Tom. Thank you, Flavia. Pleasure. And uh, for more information, please visit our website, www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you.